Welcome to the Exposed Street Podcast with Jared Vinny. Today's episode, we're going to go over the squat speed uh, stuff again and uh, got some actual questions that had come from the book. So thanks for all the people out there that have bought the book and been supportive of it. Like I said, it's going to be limited. I may just come out with it. I may do another batch in the fall or I may do it just once a year. I'm not sure how I want to distribute the book, but I want to thank all of you that have bought it and all the positive comments that have come back from it. Um, so it's, it's really been a blessing. I hope it helps you. I hope it, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I did have some stuff right here from it, but I also have some squat speed questions and going over that. Uh, but let, let me first tell you a funny story. I had this kid come to the gym and, uh, never been before. Uh, it has to travel about three hours away to get to it. And he wanted to come train, try to get ready for his pro day. Uh, and one of the friends that he knew come to the gym in the past and said, hey, Jared can do it. So um, this is just a funny story. Um, he came in and the first thing I did is I needed to test his 40 yard dash because his friend was trying to tell him how real the lasers are. And everybody always thinks they're fast. Hey, I run a four or five, but then they may run a four eight or I run a four eight and they actually may run a five one or a five two. So it's a lot further off than what you think. And so I'm going to do a podcast later on about fake speed training and kind of where people get out and kind of get screwed over with that stuff. But the story is, and this is going to let you know how real the squat speed ratios are. Anyway, this kid came to the gym. I tested his 40 yard dash. He ran a 4.81 and a 4.83, I believe. So he did run into 4.8s, which is impressive because you usually don't get a kid to come and run a 4.8 right off the bat, especially at the gym. Um, I know 4.8, for some of you, just first time listening to the podcast, I have a complete laser system, just like they do at the NFL Combine. As soon as your hand flinches, if you have your hand up or bridged up on the ground like you would if you're a lineman or like they do in the track, and if you were to flatten your hand out or move your fingers, it's very sensitive to your hand. It will start as soon as the hand moves. Now, I know some other people out there that have a different system that has a Bluetooth device or however it starts and they kind of have like a six inch gap room between the start and the gate so they can actually get moving. As soon as our hand moves, our time starts and, and we're clocked. So any waste of time, you're done. So hopefully I don't go too long, but this is gonna be a short podcast, get these questions out, do another one. I'm gonna try to get three done this week. Uh, the next one's gonna go over some questions. I'll get through that with this. But anyway, the kid ran a 482 and a 483. The next time we come, and so I tested his vertical, I forgot what it was, but the big thing is, is the squat speed ratio stuff, is he came in and the next, so I tested him basically his first day, didn't do any squatting or anything like that. So next day he comes back and he's wanting to squat and get a squat workout in. And I didn't know his max, I didn't know anything except for I knew his body weight and I knew what his 40 yard dash time was. So. I wrote his numbers down based off of the, what his body weight was, what what I thought he would squat at 0.6 meters per second. And I didn't tell him anything. I was just writing numbers. Um, I didn't even talk to the, to the kid, even the, this whole second day as I was writing these numbers. So I wrote down the squat speed numbers for what I wanted him to squat. And then I gave him that and he went with another kid to squat. And I went off and I did something else. And I said, oh shit, I gotta go check on this kid, and see, see what he's doing. Uh, Cause I don't know if he knows how to box squat or how we do it at the gym or whatever. So the kid, I go talk to the kid that he was squatting with and I was asking him about his squat speeds. And so the kid was telling me and that the, the new kid, the kid that ran a 4.8, 40 yard dash turned around. He said, the fastest I can get is 0 0.6, 0 0.61, and the rest of them were fives and went to the fours. He said, I couldn't get any higher than a six. And I stopped the gym, I said, I'm a genius. I wrote his squat workout numbers based off his body weight and his 40 yard dash time only, just because that's exactly what it yielded. Uh, so for eight three, I had multiplied 1.65 times his body weight. And, cause that's what it was in the four eight, so I was just, trying to see and narrow down where these squat speed ratio numbers are. And it's not always squatting 0.6. Remember, he only got 1.6 at 295, 200, somewhere around there. And uh, I forgot what it was, but I just remember, I didn't tell him how to box squat. 
that's what he went over there and did, and that's what he got. So it was a point six one, I believe, um, and he ran a four eight three forty yard dash or four eight one somewhere in that range. So I was able to do his squat workout numbers based off his 40 yard dash and his body weight. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I had to stop the gym telling everybody how much of a genius I was for knowing how to do that. And But I'm always trying to reiterate to the kids at the gym that these squat speed numbers are very, very important. If you're not hitting certain weights at certain speeds, you're not gonna hit these 40 yard dash times. Now I got a kid that probably drives about an hour and 40 minutes away three days a week to come see me. He has a super low relative squat. He squats 1.2 times his body weight at six meters per second. But no body fat, extremely well built. Um, so I'm gonna test his 40 this week. I'm gonna see what that is. So I can get some good numbers. I think it's gonna be very interesting to see where he's, where he's at with, um, with low squat speed numbers. Uh, but he runs about a 2.95 in the 20. So he may run a 5.1. Five flat 40, um, just depends on where his back end speed was. And so on my next podcast, or whenever I do that uh, podcast on fake speed training, I'm gonna go over, I can tell if you got faster by your 20 to 40 time, if you had been timed somewhere else, or if you went to train somewhere else and kind of how that is. So anyway, hello, Jared, uh, loving the content, keep it coming. I bought the book and eagerly awaiting the, the delivery. Now for, for some of these people, Ricky is from London, England. Reach out to me if you've not gotten your book by now. I know them. I just, you know, you got to do all this um, customs paperwork or it kind of comes in and hopefully my system just prints it all out there. So anyway, uh, tag me, sh show me, let me know you got it. I About 12% of my books are overseas. So that was kind of nuts. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of Texas, a lot of Pennsylvania. So it's kind of, I should have brought the list home again. I didn't. But um, yeah, overseas people, thank you. So anyway, love the content. Keep it up, bought the book, either way to the delivery. Question about box squats and speed reps, please. I can move 0.6 meters per second weight for nine reps with less than 10% drop off. All right, Ricky, uh, is that too many reps? Yes, it is. How, will I, how would you advise I progress? Higher weight for 0.55 meters per second as an example for six reps, Ricky? Um, six reps, anything greater than six reps hinders strength development. So if you talk about the, or you're listening to these speed coaches or these people that say they train people to get faster, they'll say squat will make my athletes slower during the season. Hey, I don't squat my athletes during this time because it makes them slower. Squatting is not making your athletes slower. It's how you're squatting them. So if you're squatting greater than six reps, so if you're doing three sets eight, three sets 10, or kind of whatever generic, most sometimes the people in these college programs do, you'd be surprised that these high level coaches that get paid hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars per year have no clue about program design or implementing a program that will test for results to make sure that the athletes are getting the results from the workouts worth they're getting. But some of these strength conditioning coaches still nowadays will just come in, try to see how bad they can beat the kids up. Hey, let's go lunge for 30 minutes. Hey, let's do wall sits. Hey, let's do all these crazy. They want their tongues hanging out of their head and they want them tired. They want them in shape. They want them conditioned. Screw their vertical. I've had a kid um, lose three inches in a season off his vertical jump because he went to college. And I'm talking about power five schools. I've had softball females go to college, almost break the collegiate vertical jump record as incoming freshmen and halfway, almost all the way through the semester, they have lost two or three inches and the coach is trying to change the athlete's jumping technique, how they're jumping, what they're doing. What they're doing is they've taken their power away but not squatting. Some of these athletes don't even squat their season, like I said, because the strength coaches think it makes them slower. Anything over six reps, and I forgot what book that in, hinders strength development. So if you're talking about producing maximum power output, we stay on our squats. We never squat more than five reps. Um, if we do, as we may box squat, then we may do a front squat accessory. We may do three sets of six or three sets of eight for mobility, but it's not a high threshold weight. It's a weight just to push us past our normal range of motion so that we can get stretched out and stay mobile and produce force and a greater range of motion. So. 
Is six reps too many? Yes, Ricky, six reps is way too many reps. I'm at uh, nine or 10. Uh, I think uh, I had this kid in the gym the other day, plays, uh, he's a collegiate quarterback. He squatted, I want to say we had sets of five at 355, and I, he may have hit a 6-3, a 5-9, a 5-3, a 4-7, and a 3-8, if that's right, I forgot. I've actually got a YouTube video on it so I can show people. But I want to do better than that. I'm trying to make figure out how to make a YouTube video with so that you can actually see how we're squatting and how he's moving the weight to get those specific numbers. And it's not always, 0. 0.6 is our max. Um, and sometimes we don't go per workout, but like he may come in today and his highest speed may be a 0. 0.57. What I'm saying is that six is going to dictate and tell us where our 40 yard dash numbers. Now you may have to manipulate their sets and reps during the training process in order to get that 0. 0.6 to go up. Um, he may hit 405 today um, at a 0. 0.6, but I don't think so. Maybe a 0. 0.57. We'll see. Uh, I can talk about that tomorrow after I do it today. But uh, he started off at 285 at a 0.6. And he's got a shot to move 405 at a 0.6 day only after four months. And I don't know how many, about 30 something pounds a month, something we're averaging. So uh, we're getting pretty good gains um, in this month after month after month. And we're just not wasting our time. And I see we rest about five minutes between our squats. And when he's done squatting that set of five or that set of three, he just kind of sits down on the box and it takes it out of you. We're not, we're not fresh after we squat. That's why we're taking about five minutes between sets so we produce optimal power each set, each rep. It's not how fast you do the set, it's how fast you do each rep. And if you put maximum speed behind each rep, trying to get those numbers, and if you got a set of three, you got a set of four, or you got a set of five, you're going to sit in that box, and when you're done, you're going, oh, man, I'm glad that's over. Then after we finish one, we go jump. Uh, I don't know what I said in the book, but years ago, we used to jump, then squat. Now we squat, then jump. And I did have something about Jared. Um, it says in the book that you're all jumping three days a week um, and that you're squatting three days a week. I said, yes, that's true. We do jump. After we squat nowadays, used to back in the day when I didn't have a gym full of people, we would jump then squat. But now the gym's so full, um, we can go be more consistent with our squats, being that we're squatting first. That way, if we spend more time jumping one day, we don't come in the next time and jump longer and our, affect our squats. So now, if we squat our jumps can be a little bit more consistent afterwards because sometimes if we were to, I mean, our squats are more consistent. Sometimes we'd come in and we'd jump, we'd jump for 30 minutes, then we'd go squat. Sometimes we'd come in and jump for 15 minutes, then go squat. Then however long we spent jumping was going to directly affect how we were going to do our squats. So, but with more people, more people coming in, and the gyms kind of forced me to change certain ways based off the time and the populations. So now we come in, we get the most important thing over with, which is, which is our squat. Then we go work on our jumps. Then we get our accessories in. And so based off of kind of where their weaknesses are in a 40 yard dash, it depends on which accessories that I pick for most of them. So we'll kind of come in, squat, get that over with, go jump. Now we can spend 15 or 20 or 30. Or sometimes these kids spend 40 minutes trying to break that jump. And then we move on and get our accessories. And then by the time the next wave of people come in, we're not holding up a squat rack uh, or a bench rack or whatever it was all racks to where the next group can get started because my person spent 30, 40 minutes jumping. Now he's got to go squat and then there's another rack mess up. So it's a lot easier for gym flow on that. So Ricky, I don't know if our, you, you can squat at five meters sometimes. Like I said, this kid may start off at a 0 0.57 and jump to him 5.1. He's got sets of three today, 5.7, 5.1, 4.8. Somewhere in that range, or maybe a four or three. So I don't know. I'll write down and we'll talk about that next time on the podcast. So anyway, this question, uh, Brian uh, from uh, Michigan, after reading through your jump book a few times, the jump book is really small and it's to the point. It tells you how I pick the weight, how I manipulate the weight around in order for people to progress over time. 
And sometimes you can order a book that's 100, 200, or 300 pages. You get to the end of it, you're still asking yourself, did I learn anything? I may have got some concepts, but no hard knowledge on how to directly improve or how to go about it over time. So and it's small, so you're able to read, read it very quickly, get the information you want, move on, take it to your gym, start improving. So Brian, I'm glad you're able to read through it several times. And if, if it's not clarified much, of it, it took me so much time to try to sit there and figure out how to get this busy brain of mine on the paper. So you all just been listening for me for a long time, knowing I've talked about that book forever. So it's out. I know how to do it. Now I can progress and do some other stuff fairly quickly just because I've learned how to do it. And that's why I want to do it all on my own. So I never have to rely on anybody. And I forgot if the person's listening, someone mentioned on my Instagram, Jerry, you see how much West Side's changed and Slew's handed over Tom? You see how much better it is? You're not very good at writing the book stuff. You need to get someone, go ahead and pay someone to do it for you. That person sparked the in me to even get moving on the book further. So whoever you are, uh, thank you. So after reading through your jump book three times, I'm fairly certain we're doing the squats correct and the numbers, we, they're where they need to be. What we were not doing was correctly was the jumping portion. We almost never jump without weights because of low basement ceilings. So just like you talked about, but we were only getting a four to six inch difference with 30 pounds. Uh, so in the book, I tell you like, I got to see this kid's squat speed um, to see if he needs to be jumping with 30s, but we're only getting a four to six inch difference. And I talk about in the book where we can hit certain weights we jump with would yield this much of a vertical jump increase on that day after. So once we knew we get to this certain weight and we get 10 inches after we hit that certain weight, that's when we're ready for these numbers over here. And so and over time, you can see it and how it progresses through it. So it's pretty, and I put some hardcore examples from kids' folders and how I would um, create my jump stickers. That's all in that book. So um, I was also revising on the wave of the dumbbell jump weights. In four weeks, when we track it over, we're, we move and jumping into the garage. So that way they can go one weighted, one unweighted, or two weighted and one unweighted and I'll start him at this wave and get him through a cycle then probably move up. So Brian what I would say is don't move him up in weight cycles until he's able to get or until he's well I mentioned in chapter three of the book I think where we are in that squat range so before they can choose this or this weight right here. So thanks for your help. The book was great. Thanks, Brian, for the compliment. Another one. Hey, Jared, I just bought the book, and can I tell you how I'm excited for it to come in? Thank you again for sharing this information in your book and on your podcast. I have wondered a lot lately about transitioning from being a high school strength conditioning coach to doing a private strength conditioning. Would you consider doing a podcast discussing the business side of what you do? How have you found success in marketing the high school and college athletes? or students that have weight classes at school, how do you sell them on the importance of extra work with you? Do you separate levels of memberships for kids that come in for more or less often? Overall, I'll be interested in see how you have your day-to-day -day structured and your business to be profitable and continue to grow. Thanks again. Um, so, yeah, I don't know why I did not copy this, guys name um so i'm gonna go over that um and i've got a, another thing from dylan where he sent me the excel spreadsheet i think i'm gonna go over that on the next podcast then after that's when i think i'll do the fake speed training podcast so uh, i don't have my phone or my computer to see the name so i can't give the person a shout out but anyway i'll do it tomorrow so uh, we'll talk about that we'll talk about the business side of my day-to-day -day operations and how it goes about doing what i do so and I'll go over Dylan's stuff about the um, Excel spreadsheet and why he kind of got stuck in the mud with his bench press. So that's all I have today. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, again, any questions or whatever the podcast you've listened to, um, thank you all for all your support. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the questions. Um, you can email me. The best way to respond to me is email me. I do have people that I should have jotted down some Instagram stuff and I tried to just shoot them some Instagram stuff back. Please don't message me on my Jared Bidney um, Instagram because 
I hardly ever see that one. I usually, just, when I click on my phone, it's always on the explosive mechanics one. And I usually only go flip to the Jared Biddy side when I um, need to post something that I've not posted in a while. So um, I've, lately I've checked over there for questions and so I was able to answer it, but I rarely ever see that. So see that. So anyway, if you just mess me um, at the explosive mechanics side, I can see that it's a lot easier now that I know using my computer instead of my phone because it organizes it and the people who've done it in what order. So I don't have to worry about someone messaging me and I'm not seeing it for like six weeks later. So yeah, email me is the best way if you want your questions answered. Sometimes I don't email you back. I kind of put the email off to the side for, and I just put it on the podcast questions. And then when I get ready to do a podcast, I pull those questions out, print them off on sheets of paper, then put them up and go over them with you guys. So um, thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, have a great day.